Well, there's the uh, opening whistle. It's noon here in Fort Atkinson. We welcome all of you to this webinar on precision feeding with Dr. Mike Hutchins. We'd like to thank Zinpro for their sponsorship and their uh, performance minerals for bringing us this webinar. Um, I'd like to also mention that the next two webinars will be in November and December. November is going to be Rethinking Cow Grouping by Mike Allen of Michigan State. And December will be uh, Big Dollar Dairy Decisions uh, focusing on those big dollar herd decisions with Jim Barmore and, and he's a consultant. So uh, also encourage you to check out our archived webinars and they're at hordes.com slash webinars which is likely where you found this. But uh, with that I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, very good. I, too, Lucas, want to thank uh, certainly our sponsor here, Zimpro, and, of course, the, the staff at Horse Dairyman for the continuing uh, allowing us to bring webinars uh, to uh, the U.S. and actually international dairy industry. So let's get going because uh, I really got the pressure on me from, from Lucas to stay on schedule on time here as far as that goes as well. So we'll be off and running here once we uh, figure this out, Jim. Uh, uh, we are not moving very quickly here at this point. Uh, Jim is coming over now. It, it came up. I think we're all set. Well, I, I thought I'd, I'd put this on, that change is happening. And our theme is precision feeding, and, and a change is really happening out there on the dairy industry. We know that. Some of you in the U.S., maybe you foreign uh, attendees haven't seen this, but boy, the first week of October was just amazing. Uh, you probably saw the stock market and the oil and your gold prices drop. Well, so did commodities. And we saw corn drop nearly a dollar a bushel. Soybeans dropped over two dollars a bushel. And milk futures also dropped, although we were expecting that to occur as well. In fact, when I was up at Expo last week, uh, there was uh, there was a time you could buy corn for 340 a bu uh, excuse me 540 a bushel in Minnesota. We expect those numbers are going to come back up a little bit once the economy uh, uh, straightens out and it looks like the uh, according to the news this morning the European Union is going to uh, solve the the Greece Spain Italian situation and it looks like they bailed out a Belgium bank this morning as well. So all that impacts our dairymen as far as that goes. And so with that as a backdrop, we're going to say what are we going to talk about and and. Today's um, theme of, um, of uh, precision feeding, we're going to look at how this uh, precision feeding will affect milk prices. There's opportunities, and I use the word take control. And take control today, the focus is going to be on variation in feeding programs and certainly ways to identify opportunities on dairy farms at this point. Well, one way to take control is to make your own money. And so you can see uh, here in Illinois at Champaign, along with the football team, I am making $100 bills with my likenesses on. And, of course, it's 100 pounds, so we got that EU uh, flavor in there as well. I thought, uh, Lucas and, and uh, the rest of you, we'd start off this morning a little bit, or I guess this afternoon, kind of looking at what, where, where is this feeding going and what are some of the challenges. These are the five numbers that almost every dairy farmer in Illinois or in the U.S. or in uh, Europe should have. And we're going to give you some uh, ballpark numbers on how that has changed very quickly in, in the last several months here. So let's look at these. These are the prices that I am using right now. Now, if you look at today, right today, that corn silage price might be about $10 too high, but the rest of them will look to be pretty much spot on. The corn grain is coming back to that point here. Cottonseed actually has dropped a little bit from that point, but gives you a little bit of flavor of what feed prices I use to determine the next two power points as we set the stage for precision feeding. There's that very mythical cow, and if some of you were at the seminar, webinar, our very first one in January, you saw this, but the numbers have really changed. Uh, you can see that we were typically looking at about $5.50 in the yellow number down there in the, at the 5 o'clock position on this PowerPoint. You can see how those numbers have increased now with the higher feed prices. Look at my forages. We've, uh, we've literally gone up almost 30% or 40% in forage costs and byproducts, and that's being led primarily by fuzzy cottonseed and some of my corn byproducts products that also has gone up from 12 cents per pound of dry matter up to 16 cents. So that's the basic number. Every dairy farmer should have this number because it leads in to my next PowerPoint and these are the ones that probably you would write down if you were my student in my class. You can see with that feed price of 665 or up there at top, that ends up being about 13 cents per pound of dry matter. For our European friends, that's going to get you around 28, uh, 28, uh, doll, uh, 28 cents per kilo of dry matter. So what does it cost to put feed on the table? And precision feeding is a player that impacts a little bit of that as well. Then you come down to feed cost per hundred weight, you can see about $8.31. Uh, income over feed cost, now this was milk prices back in August, September. We had 20 
$23 milk for Holstein milk here in Illinois. So you can see a nice margin. That's going to come down to probably about 19 or 18 depending on your components. So you can see we're going to take a, we're going to get down to $10 or $11 and so that income over feed cost I need we need about 10 to $11 to cover all costs and give us return on investment and that has a feed efficiency of 1.6 and that may be a topic that we'll have in uh, 2012 and we would certainly welcome your comments those of you online if you have topics you'd like to see we've had several feed industry people indicate topics they would like to see and as dairy producers and educators if you have a topic let Steve Larson or, or Lucas know what those topics might be of interest to you so those are the magic numbers and we're saying can precision feeding actually fine-tune and hone in the magic numbers again 13 cents per pound of dry matter eight dollars and 30 cents for 100 weight of uh, per hundred weight now this is only for the lactating cows does not include dry cows or heifers uh, somewhere around 10 to 12 dollars income over feed costs when this all shakes out in a couple months and feed efficiency has no relationship to the price of milk or the price of feed it simply says how good do your cows convert milk over to dry from dry matter to milk 1.6 you get a gold star so if you're a dairy farmer you got four A's there if you can match my numbers or do better than that hooray for you notice again with these feed prices being somewhat high we have people pulling cottonseed out of the diet we have people pulling tallow out of the diet we have people looking at pulling back on on some of these other feed ingredients notice when I lose milk every one of those numbers go south meaning uh, less favorable you can see so you if I if cows give me less milk and my feed prices stay somewhat similar, it's a bad, bad, bad decision. We look at the feed efficiency number. I thought I would share that. We, in fact, World Dairy Expo, I had two farmers ask me this question. What is a point of relative feed value? A point would be actually like butterfat, a tenth of a point. Most of us here are going to be working in this 1.4 to 1.6 range here. Almost every farmer in Illinois and the Midwest will be sitting there. And it says if I go from 1.4 to 1.6, that would be two points or two tenths of a point. That's worth 78 cents in total. So it's worth just short of 40 cents a point. Any way you can improve feed efficiency, precision feeding will allow you to do that. And you'll see how that pops in here in just a minute. So let's get on then uh, with that introduction. We've got uh, about 35 minutes here, 40 minutes to finish up. We're going to look at precision feeding from field to fork. From field to fork is our focus here today. Uh, a person many of you would recognize, a Wisconsin consultant, made a quote several months ago to me, and I loved it, and I wrote it down. One of the greatest challenges he sees is to deliver the same ration day in, day out on the dairy farm. And that's his definition of precision feeding. Well, certainly, we hopefully, that's not your uh, ration out there. This one could be a little, little hot, we'd say, at this stage of the game. So hopefully, your precision feeding doesn't end up bursting into flames. But certainly, we want to get the right kind of feed in front of these dairy cows. Jim, that was supposed to be funny. I didn't see anybody applauding or raising their hands. If you think something is really funny, you're supposed to raise your hand. So what is precision feeding? Mike Hutchin says, if that's of any value to you, providing a consistent ration. Notice what I put in there, the word physically and chemically. So I'm saying physically, it has the same particle size, length, lack of sortability going on, and chemically having the same nutrient content that we are targeting. Another definition, or part of my definition, is a consistent flow of nutrients through the digestive tract. That means this dairy cow can bugger this up on me a little bit over here. So that's another part of this point. And then the third part of decision feeding is any way I can remove any variation from the field to the bulk tank should always be a plus for my bottom line, for my dairy cows, and for my feeding system. Another quote comes from Noah Levelvin, and some of you may not recognize his name, but a good young man up at the University of Minnesota, his definition of precision feeding is laid out there. Notice he expands it a little more and gets a little more narrow. He looks at nutrient requirements that are economical, viable, sustainability, and environmentally friendly. So that's his definition of precision feeding. And if you've been reading some of your farm magazines, there's been some other definitions as well. When we look at precision, that's on the right side of your PowerPoint over here. Again, thanks, Noah, for, all, for sending this one to me. He had this at the Four State Nutrition Conference, which is held in June every year over in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. Precision means, can I really get this feed very tightly clustered? So you can look at this as day one, day two, day three, day four. Precision-wise, we've got it right on. Now, today, we want to take and move that tight and put it over here in accuracy. Accuracy means you're kind of hitting what you're targeting. And so what we'd like to do is take this precision and just put it right over here, and then we got the best of both worlds. And that's what you call a successful feeding program out there on the dairy farm.
Well, you might ask, well, Mike, why are you talking about this? Well, the point is there's dollars on the table, a lack of precision. This would be way back. One way to look at precision feeding is feeding exactly what the cow needs. If I have a 4% way back, and that's 2 pounds of dry matter on a 50-pound cow, sorry, my European colleagues, everything's going to be in, 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 in uh, pretty much U.S. numbers at this stage of game. That's about 22 to 24 to 26 cents a cow a day. That is what I no longer get into the cow. Now, some of us will feed that to low-producing cow strength. Some of that give us to steers, but it certainly is a factor. If I shift uh, dry matter in my corn silage because it rained or I got a different field or a different hybrid, that can represent a 5 or 6 or 7 percent uh, cent cost per cow in terms of feed balance and or lost milk production. Shrink, and I think Jim Barmore will talk a little bit more about that in December. If I have a 10 percent shrink, and that's a big number, but that would mean I'm losing 55 cents a day. Those of us that have bay, uh, bunkers and piles, you look at forage shrink, according to the Ohio people, if you're at 10% feed loss, you've done a wonderful job. You get in your bags and upright silos, that number can get around 5 or 6%. If I put that ground corn or soybean or protein supplement into an augered vertical bin, I can drop this down to 1 or 2% because I have very good control over wind losses, rodent losses, bird losses, and accuracy of delivery into the TMR mixer. If I screw up and overfeed one pound of protein supplement because I didn't balance the ration, I didn't mix I didn't get the right amount of the mixer. The mixer didn't do a job. That's going to cost me 21 cents per day in, in terms of lost protein cost. If that's milk production, that can represent several pounds of milk. So precision has lots of potential risks out there out there in the feeding program. So here we're going to vote, Jim. Are we going to turn on the, uh, the vote? Uh, here's your chance to vote. And so I will answer my answer. I will give you my answer at the end. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer. Let's start voting. So what area has the greatest opportunity to... Uh, to make money or which area has the potential for the greatest losses. So at this point you should now, the poll is open and you can click on it and we've got people voting at this stage of the game right now and uh, rapidly going, well, oh I tell you we must have a bunch of Democrats online, we're up to almost 70 percent and uh, we're almost at 30 seconds so uh, they're really voting here. We appear to have uh, much like the Republicans, uh, uh, some very strong ones and then some, like some Democrats uh, didn't get a vote at all at this point. Jim, let's so I'll wrap it up, and uh, can they see this, Jim, the, 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 the poll? Jim has said he's going to let you see it, and uh, are they seeing it now, Jim? Okay, so you can see the winner here is mixing variation. Slightly more than half of you selected that. Uh, the next was nutrient variation, 13% field variation. Nobody voted for rumen variation. Guys, I, I'm not going to chastise you, but I think it's huge. I think it's huge. You'll see what I mean. In, in, and then 10 votes for ration variation. So we're going to go ahead and push on. So I think I can do that, Jim. Can I not? So let's look at each of these very quickly with about five to seven minutes on each one. And what do we mean by field variation? About 10% of you like this one here. It simply says there is just variation out there in the field. My two examples, first of all, look at harvesting variation. If I look at corn silage, I normally have a wider window. In fact, here at the University of Illinois, we plant corn about every seven to eight days on our farm to build in some variation so that all fields aren't at the optimal dry matter or maturity to be chopped at the same time. Contrast that to a legume grass forage, uh, three, three cuttings in northern Wisconsin, six cuttings in Illinois, ten cuttings in California. And so certainly you and I all know that's going to be a variation because of moisture, growing conditions, heat units, all that kind of good stuff. In the yellow, we're saying, how do we get a handle on that to try to reduce that? Well, you've seen now some of our new uh, new forage cho processors, choppers, have an NIR mounted on the spout. That's right. So as you're chopping in the field, they can tell you in your cab the dry matter, the protein, and some of the other organic molecules, uh, products out there as well. Now, obviously, it's going in the truck or in the wagon. You have to decide what are you going to do with that if it suddenly changes rapidly. But at least now you know about it in the field, much like our big combines right now harvesting corn and soybeans at this point. So that's why some of us have gone to higher levels of corn size because we recognize this alfalfa, this clover, the these grasses are going to be more variable in content. Now, in chopping, that's another problem. We have tremendous changes in dry matter, and that's why some farmers like corn silage is because generally that big old stalk doesn't jump around as much as what our alfalfas and grasses will be, depending on the grind day, uh, moisture, rain, and those kinds of factors as well. And, of course, certainly that will affect yield. Again, uh, we see these new big uh, modern uh, uh, field choppers, processors, they can actually adjust on the fly. We saw one in Ohio last year in which, 
sides, when the corn sides got dry, it would automatically reduce the theoretical length of chop from three quarters to a shorter length because we know that doesn't pack as well, and it would tighten up the rollers automatically. Nobody had to stop. Nobody had to change it. The machine knew, just knew to make that change. So certainly we're going to see some technology in the field now that may help us on this one at this point. This comes from Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, uh, shared, uh, sent to me about four months ago. Shows a, a, another variation in the in uh, in the crop out there. You can see this is seven hour in vitro starch digestibility. So you can see this this corn silage over here, uh, the starch in this corn silage is going to be extremely fast, uh, and that's going to have some effect in the rumen. This stuff's going to be pretty slow over here. You can see the average sits in the high 70s, and of course some of you in Wisconsin know that Pat Hoffman and Randy Shaver have developed an index using this as part of an index just like we index legumes and corn silage and grasses. So again a big variation sign out here at this point. The last one I'll touch on is a herd I work with a little bit in Mexico and basically they buy a lot of corn silage from different farms and we will see corn silage all the way from 23 to 29 percent. This last year we had some 31s and 32s. We are putting 18 pounds of corn silage dry matter in that feeding program and let me tell you those Holstein cows got that all figured out when we hit one of these extremes we will change milk production and we will change fecal scores and we can get these cows loosened up pretty fast if we think we're feeding a 29 ends up being a 33 or 34 we will loosen those cows up so certainly that's another signal that these cows certainly are very sensitive to that variation in the field so that's your first vote. So 10% of you, are you happy with your vote or do you want to change? The second one is going to be nutrient variation itself in precision feeding. So now I'm looking at the feed and looking at examples. And I thought one example is, is a, a good one would be if you're looking at a feed that is fairly consistent. We put corn silage and soybean meal. You say, why'd you pick soybean meal, Mike? And the answer is, well, most of my soybean meal is going to be 46 to 48% protein on an as-fed or wet basis. A little bit depends on hybrids and growing conditions but it doesn't change very much and that's why soybean meal is a very popular protein supplement around the world corn silage has that same characteristic moistures don't change very much fibers stay pretty constant as well contrast that to this you and I all know about distillers grains it's all over the map and that's why some farmers have uh, really uh, backed off of that and then of course we already talked about alfalfa so what can you do in yellow so this is my recommendation. If you've got a variable feed, then I'm going to limit that to 2 to 4 to 5 pounds of dry matter so that it doesn't change the ration drastically. So it says if that alfalfa has lots of variation in it, I'm not going to feed more than 4 or 5 pounds of dry matter as hay or haylage or baleage or something like that there. All of you online have this number. And so if you, uh, if you think a byproduct varies too much like distillers or corn gluten or wheat mids, then you're going to go to 2 or 3 of them and plug them in at a slightly lower level so we kind of cancel out some of the errors as pointed out by Norman St. Pierre last week at World Dairy Expo. We also know there is variation in the forages uh, as well. We'll show you an example of that in just a minute and so we'll and that's usually measured by standard deviations. We'll tell you how you can plug that in into your feeding programs if you wish. So basically if the feed varies much then you as a nutritionist, a dairy manager or an educator need to protect, I use the word protect, milk production. You say, what do you, what do you mean by protecting the milk production? Well, it says, well, we know our cows are sensitive to such things as protein and starch, and so if, if, if the protein is variable, I'm going to make sure I feed extra protein. It may cost me some money. It may raise my milk and nitrogen test, but the point is I, I don't lose milk production. On the other side is oil. We know that too much polyunsaturated oil coming from corn oil, uh, uh, corn oil and distillers grains, soy oils, all the vegetable oils, they can really hammer butterfat test and fiber digestibility. So if this stuff varies, I'm going to protect myself and underfeed on the oil side of the equation to be sure I don't bugger up the rumen. What's in yellow down here, folks? Well, the yellow says, guys and gals, a number of our labs will now give you a weighted average. So if you've sent in five samples to Rock River Lab or Cumberland or Dairy One or any of the labs or Dairyland, they will give you a five a five or six sample range value. So it says instead of getting a really high number and getting what you can do with it, you're going to get a range. Now obviously if you changed bunkers or if you changed crops or changed significantly then, then obviously you, you, you don't want to use the old data. But it tends to give you a bit, it takes out some of that variation by doing it. So ask, check with your forage testing lab to see if you can do that. Let's look at the variation. This comes out of NRC 2001 
and uh, busy slide. You can come back and look at it on the webinar uh, uh, archives if you want, but you can see uh, a thousand samples. This is the normal uh, crude protein, nutrient detergent fiber, acid detergent fiber, lignin. These are all fi three fiber numbers. This is the average number. That's what you put in your computer. A standard deviation means two-thirds of the corn sandwiches are going to fall within a plus or minus 1.2 units. So if you really want to protect yourself on protein, you say, I'm going to really be protecting myself, I would subtract 1.2 and I would put in 7.3. So now I have protected myself against a low protein corn silage. On the fiber side of it, you may want to protect yourself on the high side because you know that's going to, that's going to affect the uh, dry matter intake and fill factor on the cow. So you could say, well, just to be safe, I'm going to put that in at 49. Here, I'm going to add it. I'm not sure I'd do that on your farm, but that's how that kind of works. So this is what Bill Weiss at, was at Ohio State talks about, uh, balancing for one standard deviation, and you work across it. The second point is look at your, your alfalfa silages, nearly 8,600, and you can look at the standard deviations, and they're all higher. And that doesn't surprise any of you online, so that's why we know we have to be a bit more cautious in terms of protecting, if you like that term, if you're going to be feeding alfalfa silage. Here, let's look at on-farm. This is some New York data. It comes from a from a, a group in New York uh, looking at actual silos. Uh, here they have nine uh, bunker silos they picked up, and they looked at the variation within that silo. Neat study. And I believe this is Bill Stone's data. At least I'm going to blame him for it or give him credit for it. So you can see the best farm. The best farm, the dry matter varied five units. The ADF only one unit. NDF only five. Awfully nice, calm, very uniform bunker. You want to come to the next line and go, oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy, look at the tremendous variation. So they may have different fields, different crops, different maturities. Probably was a uh, Democrat as well and got confused. Who knows at this stage of the game. So if you look at this example on haylage, you can see here's your deviations. Uh, pretty large uh, as percents. These are expressed as percents now of the, of, of the product. And this would be the mean. So I remember these numbers because now we go over to the corn silage and a parallel study. We do corn silage. And again, you can see some very big deviations, but if you go back to your previous slide, we, we will not do that. I did this last night practicing. You'll see that these deviations are smaller on corn as a five, as percent of the of the value compared to haylage. Not a big surprise, but shows that some farmers do a tremendous job in reducing variation in their bunkers compared to some other ones as we look at either the alfalfa or the corn silage numbers. Here is an actual bunker, again, from that same group, and you can see the different levels, and you can see how they took out this column here and was measuring that. You can see on uh, over here, uh, this part of the bunker, 31% uh, dry matter. Here we see about another 31 and a half, very consistent, and a little drier on the bottom. And that's how some farmers should do it. You're putting your drier sides on the bottom, put your wetter on top because of the cut down on, on uh, losses sitting on the surface of this big old bunker silo. You have the wetter sides on top. But what is their take home message here, folks? Well, the take home message is take your facer and come down and face down this either with your with a facer or a bucket, mix it up so we end up with a price going to be somewhere around 32% dry matter. I've been on farms in which they will take out squares. And they'll take out this square, then they'll take out this square, and the next batch of feed gets this square. And automatically, even in this extremely well-managed bunker, you're going to see a swing of two points on dry matter intake. And that's going to vary how much you're putting in the mixer because everything goes in on a weight basis. So again, another trick of the trade, as we would say. Okay, let's look at ration variation. I believe, Jim, if my memory is right, um, we will look at uh, uh, this was the most popular and I see we got some questions that's great but we'll, t we'll answer those questions uh, at the end because I know some of you have have to pull out and some we've been a bit remiss here sometimes going a little bit longer than what we should and we're in great shape here uh, Lucas it looks like uh, uh, we should have been a piece of pie to see if I could be done at 1245 I think we're in good shape precision feeding let's look at the third one ration variation I think this was the 53 percent number we were looking at and uh, ration variations, I got this PowerPoint from Essie Evans, uh, a colleague up in Canada, and we look at ration formulations, he says, actually, there are two things to look at. I love the PowerPoint. When you do formulation, trying to get ration formulation, you look at the exact requirements. Are we getting those numbers right? Then we're looking at nutrient digestibility. And we're going to add a third one out here, and that is going to be basically the mixing process itself. But let's look at those blocks a bit closer. But nice PowerPoint. And she gave us 
was at the Minnesota Nutrition Conference last year. So again, these uh, two or three PowerPoints come from uh, Dr. S.A. E. Evans here. You obviously, in production, you're going to put these in, and this, this is the big question. What kind of a lead factor do you put in? So if your herd is averaging 70 pounds of milk, do you balance for 70? And most of us would say not. You're going to put a lead factor in of maybe uh, 15 or 20 percent. If it's a 20 percent lead factor when we have high feed prices and modestly lowering milk prices, that 70 pounds means I'm going to put in 84. That's an extremely important number because that's going to drive the ration. This would be your milk fat and milk protein. In the summer, if your butter fat test drops down to 3.5 and it normally is 3.7, you and I would keep 3.7 in there to make sure we lead, lead those cows. Certainly want to get body weights in there. You'll see why that's important in just a minute. Dry matter intake is, is it basically drives the system. If you have unusual dry matter intakes, it really, really affects the, the composition of the ration and performance of the cow. Mature body weights, we need to know what that is because these computers are going to grow these cows. If cows have lost body condition score, it will put gain back on. They will do that for you. And then obviously, we got these things that come into age because they drive these numbers here. Age, calving interval, age of calving. Of course, pregnancy, we know, in the last trimester, they really drive nutrient requirements as well. So the animal is very important. And here's one example that Essie did for us. This shows body weight. This is for 100 pounds of milk with the following components on the bottom. This would be the expected dry matter intakes driven by her computer at this stage of the game. No big surprise there. But notice, I will have these big cows have, you know, three, four pounds more room. Now, that also is a negative for feed efficiency because they also have a higher requirement for, for maintenance. Another story for another day. Look over here, the guys and gals. This is microbial and this is metabolizable protein from bacteria. And you can see with these higher dry matters, we get more microbial protein, which means that in, uh, increases my MP, which means I have to buy less blood meal or a, another RUP source out there in the program. So again, it drives the rumen because it's being driven by the dry matter at this stage of the game. Powerful slide for you to be thinking about. This one is no big surprise. You've seen this uh, back in the summer uh, under heat stress. This shows you as temperature. And again, unfortunately, for, uh, for you, our European colleagues, this is Fahrenheit. But you can see once we get up around the 70 degrees, and let me tell you today, uh, Jim indicates it's going to be over 8 degrees. Our cows are going to go up on maintenance by about 5 or 7%. And you can see when it gets to be 9 degrees, we had some of that uh, just a few weeks ago. This is what the requirement goes up. So maintenance requirements goes up because the cow expends more nutrients for cooling blood circulation differs a little bit and blood gases change as well so it basically says this is has to be my total mcals of net energy I need notice it goes up because of this requirement and here's the bad news the buggers eat less in fact we were out with our students on Saturday to our farm here and they were down two pounds of milk on and their milk three times a day they were down a pound and a half or two pounds of milk on that milking and the milker told us that all the cows were down that day because yesterday it was 83 degrees and dry matter intake went down. So certainly that becomes a factor as well. Uh, precision feeding on the mixing variation. This is the one we voted on and uh, I'll give you a clue. 53% of you were right. Just give you a quick clue on that one. So what, what, are, what are the factors that contribute to a mixing variation? We're going to vote again, Jim. So let's turn on the polls, get ready to vote. Uh, we're, uh, we're uh, as we say, we're in the, the fifth inning right now. You have uh, five choices. Uh, which factor contributes to the most mixing air on a dairy farm? One, overfilling. Two, uh, the uh, feed addition sequence, putting the mixer. Three, um, uh, by, uh, 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 feed, by adding feeds uh, that, are, that are less than two pounds. My example was about seven years ago at a farm in Illinois adding uh, a zinc methionine product. Uh, at the rate of about 4 grams per cow per day at 60 cows. So he was putting in 240 grams into his big batch of feed. And I said, wow, you must have a whale of a mixer. Mixing time could be another choice that contributes to variation. And then, of course, the uniformity of feed along the bunk. And are we voting, uh, Jim? Are we voting? I don't see any votes yet. Are we open? Oh, we're up there. We're up there. I just got to get my bifocus uh, adjusted here. Again, we have a Republican winner up here. Uh, half of you went for overfilling the mixer, 20% on uh, sequencing, 4% adding uh, a small ingredient, 15, 13% uh, mixing time. I guess you're seeing this, aren't they, Jim? I'm seeing this, and I try to remember that. And then, of course, finally, the uniformity along the feedback. So a pretty nice spread on that one at this stage of the game. Uh, I'll give you a clue when mine comes up here. Uh, mixing variation. Here, here we go, uh, and we, we had them listed up there on top. And basically, here are some yellow 
help signs, yellow help signs. And, and actually, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, Lucas, we could spend the whole day uh, talking on these, and, and, uh, and maybe we will, because uh, we might look at having a, a TMR audit. That's an exciting topic, and we may bring that in as one of our Hordes uh, uh, webinars in 2012, since we have got 2000 level all scheduled, as you pointed out earlier. Let's talk about these very quickly. Uh, this is a brand name. It's a TMR mixer coming from Ireland, the Keenan Pace system, and why is it in yellow because they have research in the field that says they tell you which ingredient to put in and how many revolutions you allow it to turn before you stop and put in the next ingredient. So they feel they have a very exact, it's almost like making a cake. You know, you never put the salt in at the end of your cake. You'll never get it mixed up. You put your salt in early. Some of you that make cakes or pies, and this is for Lucas's benefit because he just consummated a huge pie bet with me here just before class started. So basically an, a system. I think that's huge. When we get up here on this, up here on this addition sequence, on most of the farms I go to, I do not have a predetermined sequence or timing between add or feed. Depends how fast they move the mixer, how fast the, 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 the skid steer gets there, how much they got to put back. And I, I think that's my vote. I lost. I lost. This is my vote. If I was voting with you folks today, that's the one I would have voted, the, the, the feed sequencing addition. The Penn State box gives me a nice clue on this uniformity of feed along the feed bunk. And so when we go out on farms with our students, we will have a couple of Penn State box, and we'll pick it up uh, four or six times, different spots, different sides of the feed bunks of the TMR to see how uniform that is. And that's really part of this Diamond V Mills, and they have really championed this, Diamond V Mills, the TMR audits as far as that goes. They come out and spend about four hours. It's a big job because they bring lots of equipment and computer software programs to get that job done to try to get this uniformity as far as that goes at this stage of the game. I understand the overmixing is a problem. It looks like most of you online said it's a bigger problem than what I'm giving it credit for, but certainly a big one at this stage of the game. I'm a big fan of pre-processing forages that are tough to work in a TMR mixer. I understand some of the new vertical and horizontal mixers can handle this stuff, but I like the idea where I will take baleage, which is going to be really ropey, I call it ropey, and straw that is really tough, unless it's gone through one of those uh, combines that actually pre-chops the straw at this point. I will pre-process that in my, in my tub grinder, which I really love. And if you're a small dairyman, you can use your vertical mixer or horizontal mixer and just mix the baleage. And that may take 25 or 30 minutes. Then you run it out. But you are going to know that this needs to run for 24 minutes. And then you run it out as an ingredient on the slab. And then you come back when you feed the cows two hours later or tomorrow. And we've seen baleage keeping very nicely for two or three days, even under heat stress conditions, because of the acid levels in this baleage. And we can get a pretty nice job done. And of course, Another alternative is a new technology, and that is actually measuring using NR analysis on the farm. Noah Leatherton, again at Minnesota, was kind enough to share this with me. This is an Italian model that now is available in the U.S. There are several of them operating, and this is an NIR scan unit in the feed bucket right there. So when you scoop up your corn silage, it reads the moisture, and it can read once they get the equations in there, such things as starch, uh, crude protein, ADF, and factors like that, it reads that, comes in here to the, into the channel, into the truck. This has to be a Minnesota pictured farm. And then on the computer feeder, uh, the computer automatically corrects for the moisture. So if the feed is too wet, it says, okay, you've got to feed more pounds of it. If the corn size is dry because of exposure uh, on a hot, hot day or a different field or a different hybrid, it corrects for that. And then this person goes in there. Um, and if you have a chance to hear uh, Noah Leatherland's presentation, it's fascinating. I did talk with Larry Chase. They have a unit in, California, in uh, New York. It's working really, really well in New York because that person has more variation in his silage, and they thought they could pay for this. And I believe the number is around $60,000 for this technology, that big 4,000 cow dairy thought they could pay for it in three to four months in feed savings and milk production. The Minnesota experience is not quite that good because this guy sitting in there was really good from the get-go. And so he knew that, and he was making adjustments on the fly almost, almost as well as what this unit was there. So there's another technology that's coming for dairy producers, including such things as on-farm uh, monitors on our field choppers as well. Rumen variation, uh, a big one, a big one. And I was a bit surprised nobody, 
Nobody voted for this dude here. I wouldn't have either, by the way. But what do I mean by room and variation? Well, basically, I'm saying what kind of shifts in room pH are we going to see? And we're going to show you some data here from Illinois in just a minute. Some of you may have seen if you've been at my seminars in the last four or five years at this point. We also know that rate of passage is huge. That's why some of us are feeding strong. We want to slow this down because it's going so quickly. The rumen microbes don't get a shot at getting the higher digestibilities and some of our forage and byproduct feeds out there at this stage of the game. The role of PUFAs, and we know this is that free oil. Remember we talked about that back in January? We're saying polyunsaturated fatty acids. And of course, in the Midwest, that one is screaming uh, distillers grains at us at this stage of the game. If you're feeding more than uh, ab about uh, about a half a pound or 220 grams of free oil, free oil means that that oil has been crushed out of the feed. Uh, extruded soybeans or ground soybeans, distillers grains, ground canola, all those things would, have, would be free oil, and it too can affect rumen. What do you mean affect rumen? Well, we know it affects the fiber digesting bacteria, and it can also have some impact on the on the, the butterfat test because some of these PUFAs are absorbed and are and sends an interesting message to the mammary gland it's, as well. Other evidence of rumen uh, a variation would be a number of us. If you believe the horde dairyman survey, typically about 45 to 50 percent of us are using rumen buffers. 30 to 35 percent are using yeast products out there. Another one, another 40 to 50 percent are using ionophores, which has some impact on rumen variation and stabilizing. In the ionophore case, it's reducing uh, starch, uh, st uh, uh, reducing starch, uh, or should say lactic acid production. And of course, we're now seeing DFMs. And, and Corey, we were uh, Lucas, we were surprised to see that in the horse dairy survey last year that uh, 10, 11 percent of the farmers are using direct-fed microbials. We differentiate that from yeast products. So again, all these things are telling us that we are trying to reduce variation in the rumen because our cows give us less milk or they uh, change their butter fat or milk protein levels and right now uh, milk protein oh, we'll kind of cover that here in just a minute now this is the slide I want you to show on rumen variation done years ago by Marv Bryant and Carl Davis and Jimmy Clark you can see here this is the pH on the bottom and they categorize this in a number of different studies done here in Illinois fiber digesting bacteria and uh, you know th this is kind of like the Vikings football team you know they lose quite a bit so you can see when the Vikings get on an acid field or in this case the fiber digesting bacteria over here crank your neck sideways it says Yield. This is grams of cells per gram of substrate. Substrate is organic dry matter. In fact, digestible organic dry matter to be exact. So it simply says these guys produce more when their pH is sitting up over 6. And then you can see when it gets below 6, these guys get in trouble. Uh, I guess, uh, Lucas, that would be the second, uh, second half, the way Vikings play football. Here is the starch digesting bacteria. That would be the Packers. And you can see they're just going to kick the crap out of the Vikings here. You can see they do very well well on a pH anywhere from about 6.5 all the way down to about 5.5. Five. Once you get below 5.5, five, five, now you have, you have acute acidosis, and both of these groups are in big, big trouble here. And so what you're trying to do is trying to stabilize this room in here so that both of these groups are at a very optimal uh, efficiency to uh, produce microbial protein and rumen via phase. And so again, to try to reduce that variation on the TMR, here's your Penn State box. Uh, we like the three box system. We notice now NASCO sells them as either three or four box systems. The fourth box would be sitting right over here, and that's about 1,100 micron. And then that fourth box, anything that goes through the fourth box, uh, which would be in your pan now, that is going to be feed that's going to be flushed out or move in the fluid phase. So that's the reason uh, Penn State went to a choice of either three or four box. You saw this back in January, but uh, uh, it's, when we look at variation, we're simply hoping that if you ran, a, and, and, and one of your jobs, if you're a dairy manager, say, I'm going to prove that crook from Illinois wrong. I'm going to kick my ten, Penn State box I gave to my wife for her birthday, and I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to check out four or six spots on my feed bunk here when I get done chopping uh, or uh, harvesting soybeans or harvesting corn and just see how similar how these are going to be. So my TMR, this is what we want the top box. Penn State would have you sitting at 8% here. There's well, a question, if this gets over 15%, might that limit dry matter intake? Potentially, yes. It also might increase sorting depending 
on the length of that particle up there. Here's your second box, and then you've, you've got a three box system. You add these two numbers together. If you've got the four box system, this is your TMR. This is halage, and you're almost going to have to be coming out of a bunker with this. Most of your silent loaders can't pull this coarse stuff out, and this would be a blue ribbon, a corn silage, and we just did the U of I, and by George, they're right on the money. In fact, that number was close to 60%. These two numbers added together is your functional fiber, your effective NDF as I define it using the Penn State box. Rod Martin gave me these PowerPoints uh, several years ago showing what happens on, on feed bunk line from Vita Plus. Rod uh, went out to a farm and did monitoring. Here is your original TMR. Uh, we will not show that data to you here. That may come up in another webinar a bit later. If you'd like to hear more about sorting, let us know. You can give a wonderful seminar webinar on that. Here is six hours later, 12 hours. This is a one TMR. They picked them up every six hours, mixed them, weighed them, and then put it back in front of the cows. 18 hours, you can see here sets a fence post and here's 24 hours or 23 hours you can see here are your your cobs so obviously this was not kernel processed corn silage if it was they did a terrible job of doing it we call them pucks and of course most cows would say are you nuts I'm not gonna eat that unless it's uh, somewhere around 30 percent dry matter then there's kind of soft and spongy and they'll they'll wolf them down but they're 35 36 30 percent dry matter you got stupid cows if they eat that stuff because they can sort it out very well the surprising thing is this one is heavily sorted if you you look at Rod's data, this one is too. And by sorting, we're saying if I look, and let's say this box was 10, 40, 50, top, middle, bottom box, if this one varies by more than five units, either way, on either of those boxes, we are defining that as sorting going on in the TMR. The Minnesota people, Jim Lynn uses a number a little bit more higher, usually 10%. So again, how are you going to use this box to determine if sorting is occurring out there as well? And then, of course, there are room and risk factors. And again, if you'd love to go through this, actually, this is uh, put together by the Elanco people. Uh, these are risk factors that you can look at with room and function. And I'm not going to read these through you because we, uh, we discussed some of those uh, partially back in March when we did our webinar series there. But if you're looking at factors that cause variation in the, ru in the ruin, and that's our emphasis today is variation, variation. Look at them here. And, uh, and, and, and if you've got a question, ask a question. If one of these don't make sense to you over here, I'm not going to walk you through them because I'm getting pretty close to uh, Lucas's piece of pie here. And here are your unsaturated fatty acids. And you can see these guys can really have some excitement out here as well and in terms of, of maintaining. And this slide you can see I borrowed from Adam Locke, uh, from, who's at Michigan State state now at an Elanco conference. The last one, and we got about two or three minutes, because remember, Lucas, you took four or five minutes of my time here, so don't you be penalizing me here, uh, milk variation. Jeff Renault had this uh, it actually in Hortz Dairyman about a year and a half ago, and they looked at 1,500 dairy farms. He said, well, what's the variation in the milk? And here's your butter fat test. You can see uh, on these farms, uh, the normal variation was about two-thirds of, uh, of a point of milk fat, the range, very low to over almost a uh, point but a strong point. So when you uh, get off this webinar, go out and get your September um, uh, milk receipts check, and in there you're going to have, if you're like Illinois from Prairie Farms, you're going to, every time you pick up a tanker of milk, you got a butter, fat, and a protein test. Can you beat them? Can you beat that uh, crook of a Jeff Renault up there in Minnesota? And here's your milk protein. You can see, again, a much tighter range because protein should not vary that much. Let me tell you, if you've got protein variation going on, you better get your nutritionist or your consultant or your think hat on because you can see you're going to have a problem. Uh, these are from Hordes Dairyman. Every, uh, every um, August issue, uh, they put out the, the typical fat and protein. We've used this before. and you, So this would be normal numbers here. Here sits the U of I. Dick Walls pulled this together for me about a year or so ago. This would be the normal very Every one of those dots is our milk tanker being picked up by Prairie Farms. And so you can see, if you read carefully, every one of those lower ones is summer heat stress. So you can see we have a pattern to our herd. The good news is they go together. That reflects probably dry matter intake and not rumen acidosis. Here you can see, here's that magic line from Horst Derriman, 0.8, and you can see we stay pretty close to that, a pretty smooth relationship, even though there's lots of noise around there. And, of course, you'd be nervous. If you're a dairy farmer, you'd be nervous down here. What do we do to screw up the protein test over here? And if you're up here, you're saying, boy, what are we doing out there in the bunk that may have a low butterfat test? 
Munns can be another one, and Jim has given me the high sign. We're down to two minutes here. Uh, Munns, again, I like to see my Munns stay pretty tight within maybe two units. Uh, within a, within a Munns sheet here, we're looking at a, a range of 8 to 12. We tighten that down a little bit, and we know it does jump around, but Munns is another wonderful tool to look at milk variation. So, Jim, we're about done. We're going to summarize here. I picked mixing variation. That was my uh, my number one way back uh, about uh, 40 minutes ago. That was the one I thought has the greatest opportunity on most dairy farms. Noah Leveland shared this with me. So as we wrap up, benefits of precision feeding, uh, consistency of the nutrients, and you can read that very quickly. We cover them pretty much extensively. I can reduce, or you can reduce feed costs. We can take and, and have an environmental, and that's going to become bigger and bigger, folks environmental impact, and actually maybe I don't have to sample and test my feed. If I know the variation is small, I can save some money in terms of sampling my feed. So take home messages, there they are. We introduced and said it's going to be a tough year on milk prices, it's certainly not as lucrative as we had the last three or four months. We are going to have to make economic-based decisions, and I think precision feeding is here. And I hopefully you picked up one or two ideas that you can say, you bet. I think on my farm or my clientele or, or my company, I can make a difference out there on the farm. Lucas, let's, let's turn this back to you and let you cover the last couple of PowerPoints. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, with, with that, Mike has completed his fourth webinar, which I guess would automatically get him to the playoffs for the year of 2011. Uh, no one else can top him. Um, we'd like to thank ZenPro again, and as you can see on the screen, the next two Hordes Dairyman webinars are Rethinking How Cows Are Grouped. Obviously a hot topic, behavioral issues are always interesting as far as uh, uh, where you group those cows and when, and Mike Allen of Michigan State will be presenting that one. And then on December 12th, join us for Financial Strategies and Alternatives. Uh, we've also called that the focus on big dollar herd decisions, and that's with Jim Barmore, and he's a, a Wisconsin dairy consultant with the GPS group. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, I guess we're at questions. And again, thank you, ZinPro, uh, for your sponsorship and ZinPro's Performance Minerals. You can learn more about them at zinpro.com slash dairy. And Mike, it looks like we have some questions. Uh, before you answer those questions, my question is facing. How important is facing that bunker? And, and uh, is that in the ever-important mixing section of your first poll? or? Or do you include that in in another category? That's a really uh, Lucas. That's a really neat question. I, some of you graduate from Minnesota. I'm surprised. Such a great question you would raise there. I think uh, uh, it goes across uh, several different things. I think I think it it, it it does look at reducing feed variation. If you looked at my silage bunker face there, you could see that if I was facing that, I have a much more uniform product, and that was a wonderful bunker. Trust me, I've been on farms. I just wish I had bunkers that looked at it like that. Lucas, I think it also pops up in in feed variation and at time at a time of delivering the ration to the cow. So I think that's a double hit. I think a facer fits on both of them. So you know where I'm going on this one. I think you have to have a facer. Now I was on a big farm here the other day and this guy was uh, facing using his bucker but he was knocking it down all the way across. So in other words, he knocked down all his corn sides with his bucket sideways. Then he he lifted it up and tumbled it a couple times and away he went feeding it. And so a great approach there. So I, I think Lucas, uh, facing is here. Uh, some of the units are anywhere some uh, uh, four to seven thousand on a, on a bobcat hook on and I've seen some awfully nice facers that are standalone units that are obviously quite a bit more but again I think you'll get your money back on it at this one Lucas are you guys facing out there by any chance I, I believe we have everything in bags so uh, the facing that we do I, I think we're as careful as we can be but since we're all bags we we uh, our need for a facer is very minimal yeah, and, and yet then uh, to challenge, we are also in bags here at Illinois, but that's a real problem, uh, Lucas, because uh, that, that, big, that big box of corn sides that came in from that dry corner of the field gets bagged, and then the next big wag comes rolling in, and that's going to fill up about, uh, about four feet of our, of, our, uh, of, uh, of our bags that we have here. So I'm, <laughs> I got a problem with bags because I'm, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't mix. So I'm, it just depends how uniform was that crop coming in on dry matter, starch content or protein depending on what the crop is so you guys with bags I'm sorry you're in trouble now the good news with with upright silos uh, if you as uh, you'll have some coning going on and so you will get some mixing going on and of course your silent loader is your automatic uh, facer from that aspect there so interesting interesting questions uh, on that uh, anyone add to that Lucas 
No, I, I appreciate that. I, I see that Becky asks, uh, where can we access the archive presentations? And those are at hordes.com uh, slash webinars. Mike, do you want to go through the questions or do you want me to uh, yeah, model them Yeah, I'll, I'll go through them very quickly, Lucas. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, and if I get stuck, I'll call on you, so be ready. Be ready here. And again, Lucas, yes, as well, Steve doesn't even have any questions. When determining your ration, is it better to protect milk production or ration costs? I think I will protect milk production. Now, when the price of milk gets down like it did in 2009 in some parts of the United States at, at 10 or $11, then you got to be careful. Then you got to be careful. So at this point, with Today's feed prices, I understand, significantly higher. I'm still going to mil protect milk, product milk production. That's my answer. Lucas, do you want to uh, you want to in on that? I don't think Lucas went in on that. Number no, two, I'm, I'm good. That sounds good. Okay, jump in when you want to. Uh, question number two, and I know some of you have to leave. Well, go right ahead. We understand uh, here. And if you've got additional questions, Jim is blowing them up for me. Is the data available from forward sensing labs on request or for purchase? We don't have much information here in India. Uh, yes, most of the labs will provide that to you. In fact, I was at Expo here and saw Dave Taysom. Dave Taysom was in Dairyland Labs. In November, he normally pulls that together. And I know Ralph Ward does that as well. And so does Rock River. So I think most of the labs, if you roll to one of those labs and said, could you give us the range of feed values on, on your very, and they will group them by legumes and grasses and small grains and corn silages, and they'll do some grouping by some of the tests like NDF, uh, NDFD protein. So I think if you go to any of those labs, and, um, and uh, as long as I think you give them credit in their presentation, you're in great shape. So you betcha. Dave Taysom is going to send me his in November just in time for our winter series because that gives us a little idea what we're going to see out there and, and then sometimes you can even ask for different regions so I would ask for the Midwest I see Larry Chase is online from Cornell he might want to look at the new at, at the New York Pennsylvania area because that's the area he works in as well uh, next question limited uh, lim uh, limit variable feeds two to five percent dry matter is a great idea but if palatability I issue arise in such cases due to geographic setting what is the ideal solution well um, the, the answer is you're stuck. Uh, for example, if that alfalfa is really varying for you, and on your inventory, if you're like Hordes Dairymen, talking with Steve and with Lucas, they're sitting with about a two-thirds alfalfa inventory, one-third corn silage inventory. Even if their alfalfa is jumping around on them, uh, they're, they're, they're going to feed it as far as that goes. So then I would say uh, if inventory dictates that or price of feed uh, dictates that, for example, distiller's grains, uh, boy, the stuff is dirt cheap in Illinois, but yet we don't go more than four or five pounds of dry matter simply because we're just afraid of the variation, and I want to protect my cows on, on, the, on the oil side of it and also on the amino acid side of it as well. So certainly uh, um, it is what it is, but if you listen to Norman St. Pierre at his seminar, he said you can, and I agree with him, and so does uh, uh, colleagues, consultants out of California, if you put, if, you, if in doubt, put in two or three pounds of dry matter, and then when they kind of watch your cows in terms of intake, manure, milk yield, they'll tell you pretty quickly. You can't screw them up very hardly because that's only going to be uh, about 4 or 5 percent percent of the ration dry matter. It's when you come in with uh, uh, 10 or 15 percent and something is wrong, not right, too variable, uh, a little moldy, a little hot, whatever the case is, we're in trouble. Mike, we have uh, another question. Mike, we uh, have you had any experience with uh, farm NIR sensors? Uh, will they replace the, 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 key, uh, the key coaster tester or your, your, uh, your uh, microwave oven? Uh, I have no experience. I have talked with Larry Chase and a little bit with Noah Leatherman and both of them are pretty bullish on it in terms of its potential. Realizing you're probably going to have to have a herd well in excess of a, a thousand or two thousand cows to justify that kind of technology. So the one I'm excited about is not the coster. I'm excited about the food dehydrator. The food dehydrator, unless you need that answer immediately, but what my guys do, and I've got a couple of dairymen doing it religiously, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, someone or the manager or the herdsman goes out and takes a sample, puts it in the food dehydrator, it has a light bulb in it, and 24 hours later, you can weigh it, and you got your answer. No babysitting, uh, no uh, no weighing two, three times a day, and I really like that. Now, obviously, if it rained last night with three inches of rain, you want that coster tester or that microwave out there because you, you're going to be feeding at 6 o'clock this morning. You need the answer at 530. You can't wait uh, for a day from now when it's changing.
changing at that stage of the game. So I don't think it's going to replace the coster or, or, the, uh, or, or the microwave out there on the farm. Another question, what is the range of NFC and starch in a ration of cow producing 70 to 75 pounds a day? My guideline would be, notice the word my, I don't care what NFC is. I don't use it anymore. I'm looking at the three rumen fermentable carbohydrate sources. I'm looking at starch, 22 to 26. I'm looking at sugars, uh, 5 to 7 percent. And I'm looking at soluble fibers such as pectins and some of those other ones, some are around 10 or 12 percent. The new programs calculate those feeds you can analyze for those feeds as well the number I like is if the total instead of using non-fiber carbohydrate I'm going to be using rumen fermentable carbohydrates which can be chemically and which can be analyzed by NIR I want that number we're on 40 to 42 and there's some neat studies that you would have seen in the last issue of Hortz Dairyman from ADSA where the Minard Institute uh, played that game uh, of, uh, of swapping out starch for, for a byproduct. Uh, Glenn Broderick played that game several years ago with sugar. He swapped sugar for starch and uh, saw, uh, in fact, a slight increase in milk production. And, uh, and uh, depending on what your starch and molasses prices are, uh, it could, could be favorable as well. So that's where I want to be on those numbers there. If you get high producing cows, I'm not going to cheat those numbers very much. I think the real cheat comes on the starch side, and I'm being repetitive now from the one of the early webinars that if your corn is finely ground, your high moisture corn is really wet, your corn size is very well fermented, then you're going to sneak uh, starch to a lower number because we know it's going to be much more rapidly fermented and I'm going to try to stabilize the rumen. Another quick question, according to the Penn State separator, it's necessary to use daily or weekly to monitor the TMR. Uh, I don't think you'll do it daily unless you got a, a, lo a lot of extra help around there and in doing it. So I would say, that's a neat question. I kind of wish the guys in Diamond V were here. I would like to see my guys probably doing it weekly. And I think maybe that's a bit more frequent. And a couple of you chime in. I know we got some consultants and other educators online chime in here. But I, it would seem to me that if you notice, if you, meaning the, the, the feeder, and by the way, the most valuable guy in your farm after the owner, in, and your herdsman is going to be your 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 feeder. Hey, he he or she controls so much on that farm. So when I watch these guys mix and this guy comes back and he puts some back, he go gets a little bit. I am really really impressed. And of course now with these new weighing devices we have that we can actually track these feed track systems. Wow, uh, we can really really make her work as far as that goes as well. Okay, did I ask that question? Or did I get off on tangent? Okay, Jim has got to keep me honest here. Uh, another question: Is it worth uh, to feed high NEL rations to dry cows that have low body? Just going to try to gain some body weight back in the dry period and then the maternity period? I, my answer is yes. My answer is yes. And let me get. Uh, and I got some field experience on that one. Uh, our big herd down in Mexico, they have what they call uh, a, a a a thin dry cow group. Now most of them have had some locomotion scores or some metabolic uh, twin or uh, twins or a DA or something like that and they will actually feed them seven pounds uh, three kilos for you uh, metric people they'll feed them seven pounds steam flake corn on top of the dry cow program the dry cow program is a fairly much of a maintenance type program where cows that are body condition score 275 or higher go into so any cow below 275 is put in here if the cow does not have a locomotion problem about half those cows grow graduate from that pen in about 40 days because yeah they can they can really they can really put her on as we'd say in the big 10 we recommend adding no more than a half a body dish condition score in the dry cow program and you can do that in the dry cow program with a high NEL higher NEL diet by adding more grain or putting more corn silage in there so certainly you can modulate the body condition score at this point another quick question do you really <laughs> this could be good I haven't read these before do you really believe there are significant differences Differences in feed efficiency between breeds, similar to what you show on slide with the various body weights, you betcha. I am convinced. I am convinced. And uh, the reason I'm convinced is if you look at a, uh, we use the, the term the 13 pound tax. Now, all of us are worried about the Republicans not wanting to tax us or the Democrats wanting to tax us. A Holstein cow every day pays 13 pounds tax dry matter to stay alive. A Jersey cow pays 10 pounds tax. Think about that. What do you think that does to feed efficiency? Now, that little brown cow really has to milk. Let me tell you, she, she can't be a slouch. So she's got to come pretty close 
kilos to my Holstein cows on pounds of fat and pounds of protein. And I know, um, I, th I think, Lucas, up at the Hordes Dairyman, your little brown cows are really doing an awfully awfully good job as far as that goes as well. So uh, we'll let you comment on that in a minute because uh, I'm getting a two-minute signal. We're going to be done at 1 o'clock. What's, what's the MP? Metabolizable protein is how I recognize that. Metabolizable protein, which is coming from microbial protein synthesis in the rumen and from rumen undegradable protein sources such as the blood meals, the heat-treated soys, and of course your rumen protected amino acids. The last question, what is the most uh, practical and best method for detecting molds or fungi in lots of ingredients at the farm? I would do, I, I think you're going to look at it visibly. Now, some of you will get mad at me, and you can jump in and straighten me out if you want, but I'd be looking if I see evidence of, of mold due to discoloration, odor, smell, texture, touch, then you might go in and, and, and decide to put the microtoxin in. You can test. We talked about that, I think, a bit earlier on the microtoxin screening. If I sense that there is mold there and you're not going to separate that mold out, I'm going to put the, um, the binder in, and I'm going to be using a uh, um, a moss product for uh, the uh, the T2, the, the, the zeralinone, the vomitox type products. If the microtoxin is aflatoxin, I'm going to go with the clay product out there as well. Jim's giving me the high sign. Uh, uh, Lucas, we'll let you give the benediction. Well, thank you so much again, Mike. We really appreciate you being here to present on this precision feeding webinar. Uh, to answer your question, yes, our jerseys are, are uh, uh, eating about nine pounds less of dry matter uh, per day compared to our Guernseys and have the exact same cheese yield, so that's great. I encourage you all to check out our archives at hordes.com slash webinars. They're all there from every single month, January through September will be up soon, or November will be up, October, excuse me, will be up soon. And we thank Zinpro Performance Minerals uh, for their sponsorship of this great webinar. And as I said before, you can find out more at zinpro.com slash dairy. So thanks again, Mike, and I think with that, we'll sign off. Goodbye. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.